The original Sonic the Hedgehog, the one that started it all. Nowadays I see a lot of people talk down on this game, either taking the whole Sonic was never good, he's a soulless corporate creation with a gimmick that'll never work stance, or complaining about how hard the levels are and how you can't spin dash. While I won't lie and say that the latter group isn't partially right and the game hasn't particularly aged well, this game is incredible for 1991 standards. It was one of the first games along with Street Fighter 2 to feature expressive characters who are depicted that way through the graphics, not to mention this most important achievement, ending Nintendo's nigh monopoly on the video game console market at the time, leading to the different options we have now. I think the game is pretty good for its time. Sure, they were still trying to figure out what Sonic is, there's some mild trial and error there, the spike bug, and the slow levels don't work well with the character in Moose Fest, but this game deserves respect. Now that I'm done talking about my opinion on the game, let's get to what this video is about. On January 1st, 2021, a prototype of this game was released by Hidden Palace after someone named Buckaroo found it on eBay of all places in 2020. For nearly 30 years, there were no prototypes available of Sonic the Hedgehog 1, just screenshots in the various officially released versions of the game. But despite that, this obviously isn't the only prototype of the game, just the only prototype we have publicly available right now. I mean, this game was in development for nearly a year and a half, so there's gotta be more than that. Well, there is, and today I'll be discussing that. There are multiple other prototypes that are hard to find information on, but are chronicled by the cutting room floor, so big thanks to them. One of these early prototypes has a title screen that doesn't scroll, which can be seen in this video featuring the game running on a Sega Terra Drive, which was an obscure Japan exclusive IBM PC with a Mega Drive built into it. This is what the demo featuring Sonic and his scrap girlfriend character Madonna zooming into the screen that you may have seen before was running on and that demo was meant to be played in stores to show off the hardware. There's also this video that features early Sonic 1 footage that I'll link to in the description that contains a very different version of Green Hill Zone with a different version of the Bahog enemy who can be found in the files of the prototype we have, monitors that cycle between power-ups, wonky physics, Sonic runs way too close to the right side of the screen, the debug mode HUD is on the bottom right, the water and sky are the same color like on the title screen in the final game, and the flowers are different and the rings HUD just says ring like the prototype we have. Also, this video has a guy describe Sonic as a less renowned hedgehog, which is simultaneously the worst aging and best aging thing I've ever heard in my life. There's also some screenshots of a version similar to this one that features other stages. Marble Zone's lava is different and the torches aren't lit. Spring Yard Zone, or Sparkling Zone as it was known at this point, has pink roller enemies, motobugs, and just looks different. Then there's the builds that are assumed to be the one featured at the 1991 Winter Consumer Electronics Show. This one has the press start button on the title screen. If you didn't know, the final game doesn't have one because of a glitch. Another fun fact, all of these title screens, including the final one, aren't centered properly. Hope you can sleep well knowing that information. I don't want to bore you with discussing some of the other screenshots, so if you want to take a look at them, just go to the cutting room floor page I link. As for interesting things about this build, there's no background in Labyrinth Zone, the flying saucers, and yes, since they're identifiable, they're not UFOs, they're flying saucers that are seen in Marble Zone in the release prototype are red instead of green here. The debug mode is in the score like the release prototype in the final game now. We get a better look at the early lava and the special stage blocks are all yellow. There's also another video using early footage very similar to the release prototype that I'll link below. Now before I get to the final prototype, I think it's time we talk about some unreleased ports. 
1991, the Italian gaming magazine, The Games Machine, had an article on home computer ports of Sonic 1, mainly an Amiga one. It featured two screenshots of this version, though gaming magazines used to use mock-ups instead of actual footage all the time back in the day, so maybe take these with a grain of salt. One depicting gameplay with a strange level design, and another depicting a weird title screen. There's not really any more information than that, and the Lost Media Wiki erroneously uses screenshots from a fan-made demo and is just filled with misinformation. You guys gotta fix that. That being said, yeah, Sega dodged a bullet there. Releasing the killer app of their own system to home computers would have been a massive mistake. They were also going to re-release Sonic 1 on the Sega CD, but it was scrapped in favor of Sonic CD. Not that much is known about it, and I doubt there's actually a prototype of it, but you never know. I mean, there may actually be one, and it may have served as the basis for Sonic CD, which would make sense as Sonic CD basically reuses level themes from Sonic 1. Palm Tree Panic is Green Hill, the scrapped R2 is going to be like Marble Zone, Collision Chaos is Spring Yard, Tidal Tempest is Labyrinth, Stardust Speedway is Starlight, and Metallic Madness is Scrap Brain. Yeah, I know there's Quartz Quadrant and Wacky Workbench in between Labyrinth, I mean Tidal Tempest and Star I mean Stardust Speedway. These may have been additional levels in the Sonic 1 port though, but there's no evidence of anything relating to a port of Sonic 1 hiding in the files of the earliest known prototype of Sonic CD in 1992. Also, there was going to be a Sega CD port of Sonic 2, but it was cancelled because Sonic 2 didn't sell well in Japan. Yeah, that obscure game Sonic 2, I doubt you've ever heard of it. But us Sonic fans just appreciate Sega of Japan's brain-dead sense of arrogance and elitism so much! Anyways, the last prototype that I'll be discussing is the 1990 Tokyo Toy Show prototype. It's the one I want most, but unfortunately it might be lost forever. It's the earliest prototype and showing of the game too. All we have left of it are screenshots. It features a title screen similar to the final, except on a black background, and the emblem is actually centered. It was also seemingly animated like the final. The demo seems to consist entirely of an early Green Hill Zone that's much more surreal and fantastical, more in line with other family-oriented Japanese action games at the time, rather than the distinct, more cartoony sci-fi aesthetic that the series is known for, or at least was known for. Sonic's stance is different as he's got his arms spread out to his side. His running animation is similar though. Next we see this blue enemy that appears in one of Naoto Oshima's pieces of concept art for the game. Yet another relic of when the game was a less unique fantasy game. Then we see a snazzy sign that says, You are welcome, along with some text below it that's unreadable because Sonic's in the way. Then giant red Japanese text reading debut approaching appears, which is where the demo seemingly ends. It also supposedly had the early version of Green Hill that can be heard in the Terra Drive store demo that I talked about. Now, it's been said to be an unplayable demo, but Yuji Naka has said that it was playable, but this is also the guy who said he removed Madonna from the game and she never made it past the concept stages when that's not true and also he committed insider trading so why should we trust this guy besides it's called the tokyo toy show demo and demo in 1990 did not mean playable section of the game like it does now but a demonstration of how the game would play if you could play it he also said that sonic team intended to put the demo on sonic mega collection but sega wasn't able to find it but also they weren't able to put sonic erasers sega sonic the hedgehog or chaotix on sonic gems collection and all of those except sega sonic are easily emulatable so maybe they're just lazy i'm not gonna lie i'm generally not an optimist and these theories might be stretches, but I don't think we're screwed. In this picture, you can see the demo playing on two monitors, which might mean there was more than one copy produced. 
but it could also mean they were just able to display the demo on more than one monitor. Also, somebody could have stolen it like with Sonic 2, but if either of those situations aren't the case, then these other prototypes I've discussed might have some leftover data from this build that we can see if we find them. And this isn't much of a stretch either, as the prototype that we do have has an unused object called Object 6 that follows the HUD and is a couple of red pixels and is theorized to be a leftover of the debut approaching text, which I'm inclined to believe as objects two and three have code that can be seen in the Sega R&D news footage dating all the way back to February of 1990, four months before the Tokyo Toy Show. These were removed from the final game, so other leftovers from this demo may have been removed from that prototype as well. So yeah, I encourage anyone interested enough to join the search at least for the other prototypes, because despite them not being terribly interesting, they may have some interesting leftovers from the Tokyo Toy Show demo. So if you have the money, just pull a buckaroo and see if we're lucky enough to find something on eBay. Now I'm gonna babble on about things I think are interesting about this game. I don't hear anyone else talk about. So if you only came for just the lost media stuff, I'm cool if you go, and thanks for watching, seriously. But if you're interested, let's continue. One thing I've always thought was interesting about the game was its weirdly dark vibe. I'm talking about how the game just has a bit of an oppressive feel to it. It weirds me out how this game is one of the best-selling games of all time, yet the only real iconic stage in the mainstream is Green Hill Zone. I think this stage is definitely a remnant of when Sonic was yet another surreal fantasy platformer, leading to the misconception that there's not much unique about Sonic compared to other franchises like Mario and Kirby. Hell, even Sonic Team doesn't understand it. But after that, the rest of the stages have a more grounded feel, well at least as grounded as platformer levels can be. Marble Zone has this very oppressive feel to it. Spring Yard Zone is like a scrapyard with these ominous mountains in the background covered by a thick layer of an unnatural grayish and reddish purple sky, reminding you of the former beauty of South Island and how it's become polluted. Labyrinth Zone also has this very threatening aura. It's very claustrophobic, there's ancient traps everywhere, and that green water. Starlight doesn't have nearly as much as a creepy vibe, but it's nowhere near as vibrant as Green Hill Zone. You're just running around the construction site with nothing but plain brick buildings in the background, which I know this might sound cringe, but it just gives me liminal space vibes. Scrap Brain Zone being the last level is obviously very threatening. Starting off with a gross warm colored sky and giant factory in the background before eventually being brought into yet another claustrophobic area, that being robotic space. The music conveys the vibe very well with its two different sections, one which conveys the hopeless feel that the bass gives off, with the other one conveying the sense of hope that Sonic gives off and encourages players to go on. The special stages also have this trippy dreamlike aura with this uncommon time soft music, once again, another relic of the surreal fantasy vibe they were originally going for, though it fits well because pretty much every other special stage since also has this very surreal vibe. Also, a lot of people don't like the title cards, but I do. They're very simple and add to the cinematic feel of the game. So does the title screen, albeit unintentionally with its missing press start button text. Same with the three acts. A lot of people don't like them from a gameplay standpoint. And I understand that, but two quote-unquote acts doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? I think Scrap Brain Zone really showcases the potential the three acts could have had with you starting outside, then going inside, then going back to Labyrinth Zone. Weirdly enough, Sonic 4 of all games is the one to actually do this with different acts taking place at different times of day and whatnot. That's some faint praise, however. You can also choose to kill Robotnik at the end of the game. Why'd they even include that? I guess we'll never know. But the whole vibe and environmental message may have actually made more sense with the original level order. It originally went Green Hill, Labyrinth, Marble, Starlight, Spring Yard, and Scrap Brain. 
but if you switch Marble Zone and Labyrinth, it makes more sense. Sonic goes from the beach of South Island to going underground from the same grassy terrain to deeper underground, coming out of the natural environments and ancient ruins into a peaceful city under construction to polluted junkyard to Robotnik's base. It makes even more sense when you consider that the under construction element of Starlight was more emphasized in the prototypes and Spring Yard was originally a completed city, Sparkling Zone. It flows really well and the players get to experience the island becoming more and more polluted as they play the game. Yeah, I know Scrap Brain Act 3 sending you back to the labyrinth messes with that order, but that was added late into development. Also, the final version had to be changed for balancing reasons. The game probably would have failed if Labyrinth was the second level. But Sonic 1 does deserve praise for its environmental message and how subtle and natural it is. You don't really think about it and they weren't forced by some government agency to put it in the game because they want people to think they care about the environment. That's just what they went with. That's how you do a quote unquote dark Sonic story, right? Like this in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Not some dude getting executed and a little girl getting shot. Not Shadow shooting people because he's confused. Not Sonic getting stabbed in the stomach by Satan causing his Final Fantasy ass Princess Peach ass girlfriend to cause the apocalypse. Not Sonic and Tails arguing over dumb shit. Not Sonic being tortured for six months and Tails going insane. Yeah, I know that was added in the translated script, but still. Not all the cartoony characters being sad and depressed like they're on Ritalin and acting like soap opera characters. Just have some stakes like the classic games. That being said, the 8-bit Game Gear and Master System game by Ancient has a very different interpretation of Sonic and doesn't have that much of a dark vibe. That game was the first project by the Goat of Goats Yuso Koshiro's dev team and was developed basically simultaneously with the original. This is why some things are off, like most of the music not being the same, along with some quirks like the edges on the dirt on Green Hill. But the 8-bit game has more of a 1920s cartoon style to it. Like, the special stage music just has a very 1920s feel to it, and Sonic's just a lot cuter. By the way, am I missing something, or did Mega Man 7 just totally rip off those special stages? With the original game, Sonic's basically Felix the Cat, but equally cool in 90s. But in this game, he's Felix the Cat and he just happens to fight robots. I actually neglected to mention this in my video on the manga, but all of those series, except for the Koro Koro series, go for a much more old school cute and funny vibe, whereas the Koro Koro series feels slick and modern like it could come out even today. Another thing I neglected to mention was the presence of aliens in that series, probably inspired by the flying saucers in Marble Zone in the prototype, but maybe not. The last thing I want to note about this game is something weird about the good ending. In the good ending, Sonic takes the six Chaos Emeralds and restores South Island to its former glory. All that's shown is some flowers changing color and critters dancing around but it's implied that this act gets rid of all the pollution caused by Robotnik. I always thought it was weird how the game was about stopping Robotnik, but not freeing all the animals by destroying the badniks. I get that this was done for gameplay purposes because it's structured like your typical get to the goal platformer, but I realized as an adult that they actually did ride around this by creating the Chaos Emeralds. The reason not getting all of the Chaos Emeralds is considered the bad ending is because even though Sonic supposedly stopped Robotnik, there's still badniks roaming around everywhere. By getting all of the Chaos Emeralds, you free all of the animals who are in badniks you didn't destroy. It's actually kind of genius. The idea of restoring the island comes back in Sonic 3 and Knuckles with the Master Emerald, though I don't know if it just makes the island float again or if Knuckles uses it to destroy the badniks. Judging by Knuckles' story, it probably doesn't, but maybe it does since the badniks were probably put there by Egg Robo. However, in Sonic 2, there is no implication that Sonic and Tails save West Side Island. Sonic just destroys the Death Egg, then flies off with Tails in both endings. This is pretty hilarious to think about. Maybe they just decided, screw those guys, because the inhabitants of West Side Island were all dicks to Tails. That's hilarious. 
The only reward for getting all the emeralds is supersonic and nobody is saved in the good ending. Good ending my ass. At least the bad ending establishes Sonic and Tails' relationship in a kind of beautiful way. Even fast forwarding to Sonic Adventure, Sonic just leaves Station Square in ruins because Sonic Team forgot he could just use the Chaos Emeralds to restore it. Maybe he does that off screen. Also, is it really hard to believe that Sonic could learn Chaos Control in Sonic Adventure 2? Like I've been saying, he saved an island using just six emeralds in the first game. I get that the game has a lot of genuine plot holes, but why is it so hard to believe that Sonic could learn Chaos Control just from seeing Shadow do it? Have you ever used Chaos Control? Exactly, it's not a real thing. So how do you people act like you know the mechanics of it? I'm more concerned about what happened to the fake Chaos Emerald he used. So the moon is destroyed, and there are technically eight Chaos Emeralds lying around now. Yeesh. Good luck with that fucking lore master, Sega. Anyways, thanks to TCRF and Sonic Retro, and thanks to you for watching. Now I'm gonna go feel some sunshine.